So I'm going to be talking about the third vice president of the United States of America. His name was Aaron Burr. Most people know that Thomas Jefferson was a president, obviously. He's a founding father. Aaron Burr was his vice president. Now, this was a time when the powers of the vice president weren't really defined. Okay? It was almost a position that you put people that you didn't want. When someone started causing trouble in your party, and your party won the president's in, presidency ship, you put that person in the vice president spot. He had a rivalry with Alexander Hamilton. Alexander Hamilton, also one of the founding fathers, also a prominent figure in the U.S. history, but we're not here to talk about him. We're here to talk about Aaron Burr. They had a rivalry. They didn't like each other. They were on opposite sides of the aisle. And he was quoted in a newspaper once as uh, outright mocking Aaron Burr. What he said deeply offended Aaron Burr. So at the time, this was, you know, 200 years ago, Aaron Burr challenged Alexander Hamilton to a duel. At the time, what was customary was when you had a duel, it was largely ceremonial. You know, it was, if you challenged someone's duel, it was acquiescing to their demands, saying, you know what, you're right, I may offend you, I'm sorry, I'll duel you. When it came time for the duel, they both had their pistols, they walk 15 yards apart each, so they're a total of 30 yards apart. They turn. Alexander Hamilton, being a gentleman that he is, good man, takes his pistol, fires off into the air. Aaron Burr, as reports account, this is just from the people that were there, we will never know exactly what happened, but apparently he smirked, aimed his pistol directly at Alexander Hamilton, and shot. He killed Alexander Hamilton. There was outright shock and disbelief that the vice president of the United States would actually kill a man in a duel. He was the vice president. Imagine, just in your mind, if Dick Cheney or Joe Biden were to do the things. In the states of New Jersey and New York, he was indicted for murder and had a warrant out for his arrest. So. During the last two years of his vice presidency, he could not travel to the states of New Jersey or New York because in both states, they would have arrested him on site. He still remained popular in the West, which was not settled, but was territories, and in the South. Obviously, because of his dispopularity, his unpopularity, I mean. <laughs> because of his unpopularity, he was not chosen to be the vice president for the next election. And his party lost, and he became sort of an unknown figure. Until he hatched this plan, he decided, you know what? Fuck America. I don't need America. They don't like me here. Fuck it. I'm going to go for bigger and better things. So using his political influence in the West, he assembled a small army of volunteers. And he assembled about 800 men. West isn't really part of the United States yet, and the South is the South. <laughs> and he decided to hatch a plan to take over Mexico. He gains this influence, hatches a plan to launch a coup against the Mexican government. And he plans to become the king of Mexico underneath the United States government the United States of America, their government. So he decides to be this king. He assembles his troops. He's going for Mexico. He's caught by the United States government, by the army, the military. He's caught rafting down the Mississippi River with his army. He's caught. His militia army is disbanded, and he is arrested. Not only was he the third vice president under Thomas Jefferson, but he is the only person in the history of the United States government to actually be tried in a court of law for the crime of treason. Now, being a prominent political figure, he was acquitted and moved to France in exile. And he was left a broken and shattered man. I believe that he should be remembered as one of the most colorful and interesting people to grace the United States history.